the senator, while indoctrinated, could not explain his toxicity. You should not listen to men's rights advocates if you want to know what they have to say. Let's begin. Indeed. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Honey Badger Radio. My name is Brian, and this is the Fireside Chat, and I am here with a very special guest, a Miss Miss Ms. Carrie Ms. Smith. Ms. Ms. I'll no, say Ms. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Ms. Carrie Smith. Um, Carrie Smith is a uh, co-host of Unsafe Space and the founder of Civility Dinners. And you also um, have your own websites, CarrieSmith.net. I have links to all of that in the description, as well as a link to your Twitter uh, for as long as Twitter allows you to exist on its platform. <laughs> <laughs> that's a very timely comment considering yeah <laughs> yes yes um so carrie smith you were recommended to me to have on the show because um well uh, mostly because of your past with uh, as in, as being a member of the sort of what people call the sjw cult or the social justice cult um and i wanted to First of all, uh, talk a little bit about your history with that. But before we get into what actually happened, can you just uh, because of in light of in light of everything that's going on? Yeah. Um, the story of a person's move away from the left is um, I, I think it's going to be like not meaty enough for people because they're going to be like, well, duh, because of look at all that's happening. Right. But right. I would I would like to maybe define our terms. So um sure. What specifically within the SJW cult did yeah. you move away from? Uh, that's a great question. And I'm glad you asked it because I think that's, we're in a place now where oftentimes it's hard to even have conversations because people are using words in different ways. They have entirely different meanings. And there's a lot of people on the left who will use the words, for example, liberal and progressive to describe themselves when their behavior and their beliefs are not liberal in the least or progressive even in the least. So um, yeah, the, what I left, what I moved away from was, it took me a long time to see it. And I know when I do interviews, there's always some kind of uh, naysayer who likes to say, you know, what a dumb lady, it took her 20 years. Yeah, it did, it took me 20 years. Um, people stay in cults for long times. I've been, I've been reading about other kinds of cults since I left and um, trying to understand what's so attractive about it so I can help explain it a little more about what's so attractive about this belief system. But um, it took me about 20 years to realize that it is about, these are, these are the things I moved away from in it. Censorship, mm -hmm. control. It is an authoritarian belief system. It's a totalitarian belief system. It believes in control. Um, it seeks to control people. And one of the ways that they exert control over people is by controlling thought. And mm -hmm. the way they control thought is by controlling language. This is why you'll see they're really obsessed with language. They absolutely, yeah, they're always redefining terms. They redefine ter very basic terms like racism and sexism, but then they also coin new terms like toxic masculinity, white fragility, you know, man spreading. Mm -hmm. um, emotional labor. They're always coming up with new terms. And then they're always uh, rendering certain words off limits that you're not allowed to, to say anymore. And so they're very concerned with, with controlling language. Um, they're also, SJW ideology, SJW leftism is, is not about peace. They believe in the uh, initiation of force. So they believe mm -hmm. in violence. They think violence is okay if the ends are justified they think that that the ends justify the means 
And one of the ways in which they get the, the good intention, the well-intentioned people who are in it to go along with this stuff is again by using language to change the way people think about things. So one of the ways they do this is they've been slowly um, trying to conflate words and speech with violence. So they mm -hmm. sort of get people in this weird um, manipulated, you know, kind of place psychologically where they start to think of words and violence as being indistinguishable so that they can then justify using actual violence, you know, against ideas and speech that they don't like. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so they, they're for control, they're for censorship, they're for violence. Um, it is a racist and sexist ideology. And it, yes, it took me 20 years to see that because they do a very good job of of um, hooking you in with these redefined words. Like the people who are in it with good intent, who are in it because they believe what it says it is, they believe that that it is a belief system meant to um, to end racism and sexism. Yeah. That's what I believed. They believe and, it, they believe it's basically goodness. Yes, That's they essentially do. it is. It's, it's just do. goodness and virtue, yeah. Yeah, and don't get me wrong. There are people in it with bad intent. There are people I believe who know what it is, and it's not oh. that they wish to end oppression. They just want to be the ones oppressing. Um, mm -hmm. But there are also a lot of people in it with good intent, and those people have had a number done on them. I would say where they're kind of slowly been indoctrinated. It, it's a slow boil. They don't. You don't. Yeah. You don't. You don't join and, and accept all of this on day one. It's like. Uh, little bit by little bit. They sort yeah, of it's it's always really incremental because if you just jump into the so and so, therefore, we need to, you know, uh, genocide anyone that doesn't believe as we do. People are not going to be on board with that, obviously. Right. But if you like do it really slow and you get them to you convince them that the the people that you're up against want to destroy you they want to genocide you they want to destroy your family they want to take away everything that you own they want to take away everything that you love they don't acknowledge your humanity and you just keep doing that then you basically cause good you know well-intentioned people who are liberals to take on this set of beliefs that are like well i guess they do have to die and then this is something that has you know, this is not a hyperbolic statement. I have yeah. literally seen people celebrate the deaths of innocent people because oh, they yeah. don't share the same belief system. And they it's one of those things, you know, where um, and maybe this is even being a bit optimistic, where they will look back on what they said maybe in 10 years and say, what the hell was I thinking? But yeah. by that time, it might be too late to, like, have yeah. regrets. So, well. I wonder about that. There, there are some of them who will never look back and regret mm -hmm. it. Like you said, you, you hope they do. But um, look at where we're at right now with the mass censorship and the purges that are happening online and how they're trying to, um, all those the big social companies are colluding to try and prevent any competition or any other space where you can go to talk. Um, I yep. would have thought back when a couple years ago, back when um, when they first started flexing their muscle and they first started banning people, and they uh, remember they banned Alex Jones, and there was a whole group of people, uh, uh, Milo and uh, Gavin McGinnis, Laura Loomer. There was a whole list of people they went after. But, yeah. Um, when they did that, I saw a friend of mine, uh, Alex Jones in particular. He was banned from every platform except for Twitter at the beginning, because Twitter tries to pretend, Twitter out of all of them is the one that is the most full of crap in my opinion, mm -hmm. because they like to pretend that for, they're for free speech. And so yes. Jack will do these big pronouncements about, no, we're for free speech. And, yeah, it's and just so, the terms of service, bro. Right. Yeah, so, right. <laughs> so he was like waiting to a day or two so he could say, we tried, you know, and, and so, in that, that period between uh, when the other platforms had banned Alex Jones and Twitter had not yet done so, but they were getting ready to, there were friends of mine who consider themselves liberal, who had not yet unfriended me and were circulating petitions to get him banned from Twitter. And I, I tried having the conversation then. I was like, do you not see where this leads? I don't care what you think about Alex Jones at all. I don't care if you think he's a conspiracy theorist, if he's awful, whatever, if he, but if you in, if you engage in censorship, if you support censorship, if you're circulating a petition to kick people out of the public square, do you do you just pragmatically do you really think it's going to end mm -hmm. with Alex Jones? 
And so flash forward, here we are years later, and this is kind of what I was trying to tell some of those friends a few years ago. I'm like, we're going to yeah. be in a place where you see mass purges. Okay, now it's happening. Have any of them, have their eye, have the scales fallen off? Have they woken up yet? No. Um, I don't know. Most of them unfriended me. <laughs> well, mo- I, I, yeah, yeah, same here. But I've seen the, the few that, I, I, that haven't unfriended me. And I think it's a game of chicken with a lot of these people that are still my friend because they're like, well... I'm not going to do it because that would show weakness. So I'm going to wait for him to do it. But they don't know that I have never, ever unfriended anyone yeah. ever because I mean, it's not even worth the expenditure of energy to go and click like unfollow or unfriend or whatever. Okay. Like I, I just find that whole thing to be so incredibly petty. It's just not even worth my time or energy. Plus, if I'm like and it's not that I do this specifically to upset people, but if I'm posting my ideas I want the people who are most likely to disagree with what I'm posting to see them yes, because right. they need to I be agree. exposed to that. Not not the people who are already on board because that, that that's not what I want to foster. That's one of the reasons why this this mass purging is so upsetting because um, I'm, I have accounts on alternative media sites. But the problem is, is that when I post on those sites, there's no reaction. There's no conversation because yeah. everybody's like, yeah, obviously, I agree with that. Yeah. So, right. you know, it, it's it's what I want to avoid um, yeah. at all costs, if possible. So this is why, like today, I was talking to my wife and she um, was she's basically talking about leaving. I think it was Facebook. Uh, it could be Twitter. It doesn't really matter. And I said, well, I'm going to stay there. I'm going to stay on those sites and also on the other sites until the wheels fall off because the same. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, like, I, you know, it's not like um, Mark Zuckerberg can take anything else from me for one. But also, you know, maybe I could like convince one more person, you know, like that, that what are where I'm coming from is is a good place because. Uh, if I just leave and I just go to MeWe or or uh, Gab, you can't go to Parler because it's been yeeted from the Internet um, or wherever. Right. If I go somewhere else, they're not going to see it because the likelihood of them following me over there is pretty low if they're the type of person that doesn't agree with me. Absolutely. And I, and I don't want to create two Internets, basically. We're so, the same. We're, you and I are of the same uh opinion about that like optimistically Mm -hmm. i would that's why i want a a, a place with uh, with many different opinions and viewpoints like you said is because i really do believe that the best the best kind of conversation is is one in which you're you're challenged and you're uh rethinking your beliefs i think i heard uh jordan peterson talk about this once and i'm not gonna try and phrase it the correctly because i'll get it wrong but he was sort of talking about the idea that good conversation is one in which you you approach it with um, trying to understand the other person better and trying to mm-hmm. make sure that you are articulating yourself um, well enough so that they can understand you. It's about mutual understanding. Yeah. So it's not about being right. It's yeah. about, do, do you at least understand what I'm saying if you don't agree even? But uh, that, that like you said, once you go to a, a echo chamber and trust me, I was in on Facebook, you can be in your social justice echo chamber. I'm sure you know sure. this, but I was in one for years and years and uh, I, I never saw a lot of those people, They because they will unfriend you, they just whittle. And I had whittled my world down to just the people who agreed with me. And maybe that's part of why people stay in these cults of belief so long is because they're just oh, yeah. they're not interacting with people who have different yeah. opinions. Yeah, They don't so, see an opposite view. And when they're presented yeah. with uh the opposing view it's through it's being filtered through people who agree with them so you're gonna like if you ask ask trevor noah what the right believes yes and he's going to tell you like the 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 most misrepresentative straw man that he could possibly come up with and if that's the only person you're getting your facts from uh then yeah of course you're gonna hate them that's the point so uh, i want to go back to um something that you mentioned before uh two things actually number one about language control which uh, we've been talking about on this channel for years and years and years because we've been um as as a channel that uh uh you know wants to 
help men and boys, mm -hmm. which Jesus, that's that's demonic behavior. How dare um, you? <laughs> we yeah, we have dealt with. Um, we've been basically fighting against the feminist narrative, which is the mainstream narrative around the relationship between men and women and the historical relationship between men and women, and that involves unpacking a tremendous amount of highly manipulative language. So because we are uh, we are aware of of this and we knew it was going to spread out into every other aspect of our culture and it has been for for years yes. and years as well it's just that now we're starting to see it but it's been there for a very long time um why do you believe the uh the what what is the purpose of language control like why why does it work on people well uh Orwell talked about this. If, mm -hmm. if you want to control people, the easiest way is to control their thoughts. And how do you control thoughts? You control thoughts through language. And, you know, uh, you can see this. I've been watching several other cult documentaries. I've watched uh, Going Clear, which is about Scientology. I watched um, the Nexium docu-series called The Vow. And then most recently I watched, there's a new uh, Heaven's Gate doc, docu-series out mm -hmm. called Heaven's Gate, The Cult of Cults. And I'm like, I don't know about that. I know of a cult that's a little <laughs> bit more mainstream and widespread. It might be the cult of cults. But um, in watching Heaven Gate, Heaven's Gate, there was a section, there were several sections that I could relate to. And one of those was how they changed language. And they had former cult members from Heaven's Gate talking about how they came up with new words for things and they they try and disassociate you from memories of what those things used to be mm -hmm. um but but language is is an incredible way of restricting people um and and having them do it to themselves Absolutely. i don't know if, you, if you've ever watched um yuri besmanov i know i lot. have yeah so he's that former kgb operative mm -hmm. for anyone who maybe hasn't seen him and you can watch his videos on youtube but he talks about how you know if, if you're going if you're going to um, conquer another country, another people, it's easier to have them do it to themselves than mm -hmm. to go in with oh a, yeah a show of force yeah because you so, don't have the manpower to actually do it like they do in the movies you know like this is how it's often shown to us it has to be through um you know the but you change the hearts and minds of people and then they'll police themselves you don't actually yes. have to do that much yes and so i think that's that's uh i think that's true whether we're talking about Scientology yeah. or we're talking about uh SJW ideology or Heaven's Gate or any of these kind of cults of belief yeah. is that they yeah. isolate you from people who don't ag uh, agree with you so they encourage you to create these echo chambers like I was talking about online where you're only associating with people who have the same beliefs as you mm -hmm. people cut off friends and family they will cut yeah. off friends and family who don't share these beliefs yeah and, did and you did you hear the story of the daughter that um reported her parents because she saw a photo of them at the uh at the rally in washington last week no uh, she reported her own parents and they're gonna get arrested and yeah. you know like I, I don't know if they were um you know involved in the <sighs> in the trespassing like that was or not even call it trespassing because the police let them in but i don't know if they were involved with that but the the point is she was willing to report her own parents yeah. and she did it and then and that that is the degree to which this how scary this can be actually so it's like the stasi but yeah if if you read um uh any anything about you know the soviet russia and the, mm -hmm. and the gulags and there were people who were turning in their family members their husband their spouse their parents their yep. um it's it's much like that it's like you have this internal sensor in your head that's restricting what you say and what you think and mm -hmm. then you're also you're also acting as the, a sensor for people around you and are they behaving inappropriately are they not are they not in a, behaving in or, or speaking in an ideologically pure way are they saying something subversive you know a lot of these kids i think um it, it's it's all of this stuff works in it works in conjunction with other parts of, of, of what's happening with other parts mm -hmm. of uh, fruits, I would say, of the belief system that we're seeing um, 
uh, currently. And one of those is that classics like young adult fiction and classic mm -hmm. fiction is being attacked mm -hmm. and yep. they're, they're taking it out of school. So there's a, yep. it's a coordinated effort to get rid of it. Well, and it's, it's not only yeah. that, but the teachers in those schools are literally teaching their students social justice. They so are it's not them. just that they're oh, taking yeah. out, they're not just removing things that we need for, you know, a well, an actually well-educated, well-balanced individual that can think for themselves, but they're injecting their, their ideological Purity. Yes. And they're so. removing the things that might give kids the ability to uh, have an aha moment mm -hmm. and to be able to interpret stuff around them. We do a book club at Unsafe Space. We, we read uh, a book roughly a month and we will alternate fiction and nonfiction. So for the first year that we were doing book club, we just read the dystopian classics. We read uh, Fahrenheit 451, so relevant right now to read it mm -hmm. now. Um, of course, 1984, Brave New World, Animal Farm, mm -hmm. but we kind of, and, and most recently we read one I had never read, uh, The Moon is a Harsh Mistress by Robert Heinlein. But, mm -hmm. but if you don't have, if, if you don't have like art, literature, movies, these are great ways to help people put, like connect the dots and to have kind of an awakening or to have an aha moment. And if you're restricting what they can read and anything that deals with other versions of this ideology throughout history or mm -hmm. other versions of this kind of mass human behavior throughout history, then you're really limiting those kids when they do discover those books, by the way, hopefully that will be the watershed moment for them. I mean, hopefully, you know, reading they, that kind of stuff is like now yeah. you're like, holy well, crap. <laughs> they even, they even banned the Odyssey, which isn't like oh. at all about dystopian anything. It's simply the, it's the Odyssey. Homer's the Odyssey was banned. And the teachers, the teacher that was responsible was celebrating this. Why, um, why is, why'd they ban it? Was he straight white well, male? I mean, yeah, it's <laughs> basically just like a male Western classic story. And those are not allowed. And the fact is, yeah, I mean, like the, a lot of this stuff comes down to first, it's an attack on men and masculinity, which is, I think, what we're seeing. You know, I, I call Jack Dorsey uh, these days uh, Osoima bin Laden because he's he's he, he doesn't. He doesn't have a grasp on masculine virtues. This is the reason why he cowardly waited a couple days to ban Alex Jones, just so that he wouldn't get, um, you know, criticized. Yeah. Immediately, and, but and I so mean, he, it's just weakness. So. And so he can pretend. Yeah. He so likes, he can he pretend. He likes to pretend. Uh, yeah. Excuse me, one second, Brian. I just realized I'm going to plug in my better camera. Oh, okay. Have, You're I don't using have to the move to different... do it. Okay. Yeah. All right. Cool. That's fine. You may have to switch to it. Um, I okay. wanted to go back to something while while you're doing that. Uh, number one um, was about the people who made that documentary uh, about what was it called? Heaven's Gate. Yes. Um, why haven't they done a documentary on the SJW cult of leftism? Is it because they're uh, they don't see it? Is it because they, they're in it? I mean, if you make if you make a documentary and you because like the thing is, OK, Heaven's Gate, is that a threat to us right now? Is this something that we should be worried no. about? See, the, here are the differences. <laughs> here are the differences in, in some of these cults. Sorry, that made my face very big. Um, they one of the differences is that social justice as a cult is harder to point out and to recognize as a cult because it doesn't have what it has. A it's lot not of like as a church. Right. Well, it has a lot of the characteristics of, of cults. If you check, if you go down the checklist and I encourage people to do this, look at the char cult characteristics. It encourages you to isolate yourself. It, it tells you, mm -hmm. you, can't, you can't question the dogma. Yeah. Um, they, they have rules for people who, uh, who, who leave the cult, who become heretics. It's sort of, you're now treated mm -hmm. as an apostate, but but here's a very important one that it doesn't share is it doesn't have like one charismatic leader. So people, people aren't, they are programmed. It, it, we're used to thinking about cults as having like, who's the leader? Who's the David Koresh? Right. Who's the Jim Jones? You know, who's the guy? Well, there is no person like that. And so I think that makes it harder for people to see what it really is. Um, but mm -hmm. another way is an, another way in which uh, I like looking at the ways it's, it's di different and similar. One way in which it's different from heaven, the Heaven's Gate cult, and it, it, but that's very important is what you're hitting on is the Heaven's Gate cult. They kept to themselves. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, they were trying to recruit people, but they were not trying to remake the world to mm -hmm. the way that they view, the way they saw things. Right. And, and social justice is 
holy crap, like it's become culturally dominant to the point it's it's corporate. It's like it's yeah, it's ubiquitous. Yeah, it's everywhere. it's everywhere. And it, it's like it's like uh, uh, being a fish and looking for the ocean. Yeah. I mean, like it's it, that that's but that's what I mean when I say, OK, so uh, because I see this a lot and I still see this to this day. There are people who, while they have criticisms of the social justice ideology and all that comes with it, uh, they will still be more concerned or as concerned or as vocally critical of things like Scientology and the uh, what is that? The Westboro Baptist Church. Yes. And and I I'm and then they bring it up and I'm like, dude, I don't care about them. I think that they're like the least important, least influential, least dangerous cults. I, even if you say, oh, they they are totally cults. I don't care. Like yeah. like we're losing our freedoms on the yeah. internet, and you're worried about this. Like the, I, yeah. I'm sorry, but you're a moron. And this and I think this comes from. Uh, an obsession. I don't know if it's an obsession. I saw a post by Sam Harris. Okay. Sam Harris, in case you guys don't know, uh, he's, I mean, he's more famous for being an atheist, but he's actually a scientist. I know. <laughs> and um, he made a post where uh, right after Trump was yeeted from Twitter and his post reads as following. I have it on the screen here. Uh, he says, there's an important debate to have about the wisdom of kicking Trump off Twitter. I still believe that it should have happened years ago and that we've paid a terrible price for the delay. Before the moment, all I want to say is thanks at Jack. So he thanked at Jack Dorsey for or, uh, Osama bin Laden for removing Trump from Twitter and Sam Harris, the, the guy, the free speech guy, the intellectual he basically is like, oh, well, he should have been gone years ago. See, and and I know that he doesn't have a problem being vocally against, uh, you know, radical Islam, against, uh, you know, crazy fundamentalist Christian types. And this is why the like the atheism conversation, I just want to throw it out. It's just not important because what we're up against is literally a religion and it's far more ubiquitous and it's far more powerful. And the only reason why they ignore it is because it doesn't actually have a God at the center. And what Sam well, Harris doesn't seem to realize is, is that even if you are an atheist, you can become religious because a lot of people in the SJW cult are self-described atheists. No, nay, they are anti-theists. They despise religion. In particular, they despise Christianity because they tend to side with Islam. So, well, they're also, it's, and that's interesting because my, my co-host on Unsafe Space, Carter, he's atheist mm -hmm. and he calls a lot of them uh, state theists. He was like, because yeah. they worship the state. That's their God. They worship yeah. the government and, and he doesn't, he's not, he, you know, atheist means the absence of worshiping anything. Now I'm not going to get into the argues of, I think, I think we all worship something, uh, but we don't have to debate I, that I, now. No, no, no. But, I'm with you on that. I'm yeah. with you on that. I think it takes a very uh, unique individual to try to um, avoid some kind of, I, I don't want to say religious thinking, but like, I think to some degree, we, we try to grasp onto something that represents the infinite, the right? The, the divine. divine. Yeah. yeah, we try to grasp onto it. So, like, yeah, there are plenty of people in California that will say that they're atheists, but, you know, maybe they use healing crystals. Maybe they meditate. Maybe they practice yoga. Maybe they do something else. And so, like, um, I, I think that you, it takes a really unique individual to be able to disconnect from all of a, it. A lot of um, youth culture, I think we've especially with social media and, you know, we've, I think we've been encouraging the worship of the self, mm -hmm. you know, there's a lot of narcissism tied up in, in uh, our culture too. But, and, and obviously in social justice, you see a lot of that, but, yeah. but even outside of social justice, but let me come back to the, the Sam Harris thing for a second. Sure. There's another prominent atheist who, who speaks against social justice ideology. And that's James Lindsay. We've had mm -hmm. him on the show several times on Unsafe Space. He's um, he and Sam Harris. I see as as well. They're I, they're very different on this Trump issue and on the censorship issue. And if you look at them and you try to understand what's different, what's going on here, um, I think Sam Harris has. I just I just think he has such a 
some people have such a hatred for Trump that they can't, it, it creates a blind spot where it's almost an emotional thing. Absolutely. This is, this is just what I think. I don't know. I could be wrong, but. No, no, no. I think you're absolutely right. I see it all the time. Even yeah. the most reasonable people I know become yeah. completely unreasonable when his name is even mentioned. Yeah. Even people in the men's movement, when I say, well, here's all the good that Trump has done specifically revolving around men's issues, which is a lot. And they'll just be like, orange man, bad. And I'm like, well, yeah. I guess we can't even talk about it. Right. So yeah, well, you, you want to talk about controlling people? Wow, like they've used him. He he's been such a blessing and a boon to the Expose. media, to to the oh, yeah. media. Well, yeah. they've they've used him to mass program people to mm -hmm. to to where when you like you said when people hear his name, um, they just have an emotional like reaction. There were I don't know if you remember, but. A couple years into his presidency, there were articles about um, Trump derangement syndrome, but mm -hmm. not in the way that a lot of people on the right use it. It, it, it was it, there were articles about therapists and and psychologists who were I saying remember. that they were getting lots of patients coming in who were experiencing anxiety, increased anxiety, depression. That even mm -hmm. just talking about him elevated all of all of these mental health issues in them, and that they were trying to struggling for a name or some way to address this, this Trump mental health problem that people mm -hmm. were having. And it's like, mm -hmm. yeah, that's to me, that illustrates what I have observed just among, um, you know, online with, with, with friends of mine or, or with, with people I know at some people in real life, who still have an unfriend in me who have a intense hatred of him. And mm -hmm. I was in that, I was in that group too. I, mm -hmm. I was one of those people who cried the 91 and, in 2016, you know, and I, I, uh, you thought fascism was coming back. Yes. You thought he was I, just going to like round up the women and the Jews. I and... <laughs> was, I did think, I didn't think there were going to be camps. I always thought that was yeah. hyperbole, but yeah. I did think that there was going to be some mess that he was a demagogue and that we'd probably get into a war. And there were all these things I believed about him that, uh, over the ensuing four years, I came mm -hmm. to realize a lot of those weren't true. Some of them were, but a lot of them weren't. And, and that's true with anything. Like you said earlier, they keep you from, they keep you from investigating original source material. They just, mm -hmm. they give you these received opinions. Like you said, if Trevor Noah were to tell you what people on the right think, you, you know, I had opinions about all manner of people. I had opinions about, uh, Milo Yiannopoulos, about Stephen Crowder, mm -hmm. about, uh, uh, you, just you could name someone and I could spout off what I thought about them, but it, they weren't really my opinions. I had never no. done the work required to hold those opinions. I just, mm -hmm. I just, I just thought I, I thought they were mine because people I trusted people in my tribe said this about them. Yeah. And over time I started to notice like over the next four years, it was like in news articles, I started realizing Hey, they're telling me what I know. Again, for you guys who've never been in in the cult, you're gonna be like, "That's you're you sound no, really no, dumb. I, yeah. But, yeah. But I would read articles and, and realize, holy crap, they're not even linking to the video. They're just telling me what Trump said. They're not letting me see it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, they're telling me what he said and what to think about it. And they're taking yeah. the quotes out of context. They're interpreting and, it themselves yes. and then telling you what it really means. Yes. Dog and whistles. Then you, and then you read that article, or even worse, most people just read the headline and they come away like oh my gosh Trump said this <laughs> mm -hmm. here's what I think about it and you're like you never it's, even it, listen it's, to this yeah it's interesting because it's actually it's it is and this is one of the things I I did a, a podcast I was telling you about this where with uh, Tim Moen I was on Tim Moen's podcast yesterday he just uploaded the video today I think and Tim Moen is a libertarian candidate for prime minister that ran uh, in Canada whenever they had their last election. I don't know, but I, I only know I have a relationship with Canadian politics because my wife's Canadian and, oh, okay. um, you know, I, I'm interested in what's going on. And Tim Moen is libertarian. Now, Canada culturally is much further left in the United States, just in general. Right. So they're actually more likely to uh, regurgitate these um, kinds of talking points and become fall prey to the to the same uh ideological frame and with the, some exceptions like alberta is is the most i think it's one of if not the most conservative um province but the point is i was talking to tim moen on on his um podcast and i was we were talking about the relationship between gender 
and political perspectives. And one of the things that I meant to bring up, and I'm definitely gonna bring this up with him again, social media has had a massive effect on all of this sort of cult thinking. And I think a part of that has to do with, and this is something that I say, I say that uh, social media is the domain of the female. It's where women, um, they run social media in general. They basically decide the tone. It's sort of like high school, mm -hmm. right? And, and if you're in high school and you're a man, uh, the way in which you exert your will on other people has mostly to do with like how whether or not you can uh, demonstrate physical prowess and mastery. So, you know, if you're captain of the football team, you're going to get respect from other men and you're going to basically have influence over them. But when you're a girl, there are two ways you can do it, but, but they both involve social uh, cachet and women run the social sphere. They they have tremendous uh, influence in social situations. And it's something that a lot of us don't want to acknowledge that's true, but it is. And um, that can, but, but when it's hostile, when women want to use social aggression or aggression in general, it tends to be social. And a lot of that, if you think about if you've ever been bullied in high school by girls, um, oh, yeah. It's the same kind of stuff, right? They spread rumors about you. They try to um, uh, ostracize you. They basically warn other people not to hang around you or talk to you and not to associate with you. And they and they destroy your reputation. And if you just take that and expand it to the social media sphere, it's the same thing. If you go on, and, there, and, and I'm not saying that men aren't on social media participating, but um, I, I what I'm saying is I think in general, more women are a part of that. In fact, Jordan Peterson, there's a great video of Jordan, uh, of Jordan Peterson that is entitled, why, do, why are women more likely to be SJWs? And then I, I think uh, it's, 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 there is a connection there. And again, this isn't just me trying to blame women for this, but it's, no. to, it's basically to point out, like here's another way that we should be looking at this so that we can ask ourselves, why is this happening? And I think it comes from, um, cause a lot of SJWs are also really, really miserable and resentful yes. people. And, and so like their misery and resentment, and it's usually about their own lives. It manifests in, well, I need other people to either be a, as miserable as I am, or B take responsibility for what my life is like. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that that is to sort of like, um, to to pawn off the responsibility and basically play the victim is a kind of toxically feminine approach to solving problems and and to appeal to authority which is why yes i think they they do have a um desire for top-down control that's why they're statists i mean like yeah. severely right that's why they're severely. totalitarian so yeah you're not wrong it, it, and it's not and it's not about blame it's just about no. under this is like a lot of those uh taboo conversations you're not supposed to talk yeah. about right or you're not you're not supposed to investigate but uh women on average um you know if you look at the big five personality tests and this is something you mentioned jordan peterson i've heard him talk about this too but um women score higher in in neuroticism um, yeah let me just say, and that's not all women. If you don't understand sure. averages, you're not smart enough oh, to have this conversation. Our audience gets it, yeah. <laughs> okay, I've good. Said, I've said this to them many times. Yeah, they, okay. they get it. And there's a lot of women yeah. in the audience too. So it's not like, and, you know. Yeah, and we have, uh, you know, there's always outliers and people who don't conform to the average. Uh, I will say I conform right on with the average in terms of higher neuroticism mm -hmm. probably, but also, um, uh, women are higher in uh, agreeableness and yeah. wanting to please others and, and yeah. wanting to. They don't want to rock the boat. Don't so. want to rock the boat, go yeah. along with the the mob, you know. And so it it does appeal to women. I've I've also heard um, I think it was I think it was Peterson and Camille Paglia talk about this about um, one of the things this this ideology claims to be about is is representing the the underdog the voiceless yeah the voiceless the marginalized the oppressed it, it claims to be about that it is mm -hmm. not about that mm -mm. but that's what that's how it sells itself it's about conformity and, and so people who um if you have if women on average if 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 perhaps you know i've heard them talk about it's this more of this innate desire to protect like the mama bear thing to protect that you're young or to protect those who are being 
um, oppressed or marginalized, it maybe appeals to that. It's it's and and in hearing them discuss that, it I was like that kind of makes sense to me, and, and especially given that a lot of the most rabid SJWs I knew personally, just anecdotally when I was in it, um, don't have kids, and maybe it's fulfilling that desire for them, that kind of you know protecting someone, and. I don't know. That's you're not allowed to have these conversations now, or even to even to hypothesize. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, but absolutely. Um, well, yeah, and I, I, you know, I, I, I wasn't afraid to make the statement, but I wanted to make sure that you understood where I was coming from. Yeah, so, I do. Um, I think yeah. a big a big problem, as we mentioned earlier, I don't think we're teaching the classics as, anymore in mm -hmm. in the way that it should be in terms of literature. But the other thing is that I mean, we know if we look at if we look at the rates of of uh, math profici proficiency and proficiency in English, uh, you know, coming yeah. out of high school. Just general educational been, competency. Totally. We've been steadily declining in the oh, past yeah. few decades, steadily declining. And one of the things I think that makes it hard for people sometimes to have these conversations is just, we're not teaching basic averages and math and like, what is a bell curve? And what does it mean when you say on average? Because uh, it, it, I almost feel like we should have just, um, but that's but that's part of the language control thing though yeah because when you say on average or you know human nature is like this essentially mm -hmm. uh the left flips out because that to in their mind there is no such thing as differences between people we are all the same yeah. we all have the potential to have you know i'm serious it we are all the same everyone is interchangeable you know um uh, you are as likely to be a great saxophone musician as i am regardless of talent all we just need to be is educated properly but not necessarily educated in the skill just educated in the idea that we are all the same but and, isn't and they're, that they're, but isn't that amazing brian because the ways mm -hmm. in which they say we are different are the are the least important yes. differences among yes. us they yes. all they are all they care about in terms of diversity is what color you are and what your gender your sex is you know what your sexuality is who cares yep. right like <laughs> it's just like those the are least... the least but they they just it's just for them because it, it's the, the the irony is is that they they do believe those things but they also believe that those things don't exist so like there's no well, race is a social construct, gender is a social construct, sexuality is is a social construct. Like I can just be gay because, you know, they've written plenty of articles where it's like, well, why don't men just blow other men? You know, just try it yeah. out. Like, well, why not? <laughs> and, and so like they, they don't believe that these things are real, but they also differentiate us based on these things. Yeah. It, it just shows the logic. There is no logic in any of this. It's well, all about removing individuality. You, that is because you're exactly right. They have they have so many contradictions in their belief system, so many mm -hmm. internal contradictions. But that's because um, and Carter on my on, on Safe Space talks about this a lot. They don't use words as tools for greater understanding and communication, nope. like to get something across better. They use words as tools of manipulation. So mm -hmm. they're not concerned with whether the words contradict themselves later if this tenant over here yeah. contradicts this tenant, yeah. as long as in that moment and in that conversation or whatever, they get the power that they want. If they can use the word to get the power, if they can use the words as tools for power and to get you to shut up or to use it as a sledgehammer to, you know, to um, get whatever policy change they want. It doesn't matter to them if the words contradict other words they claim to believe in. <laughs> so mm -hmm. it's like um, race is a social construct, right? But then you can't choose your race. Okay, right. but, but sex is a social construct, but you can choose your sex. But, mm -hmm. and, 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 you know, we're all the same and there's sure. really no differences between us other than what amount of privilege we have based on these social constructs. And therefore it's very important to have people of different uh, skin color yeah. and sex on your, you know, it, that's the highest virtue in their opinion is to, is, to, um, is to have people who look different, but it doesn't matter internally if they think different. In fact, no. they want us all to think the same and speak the same, like a Borg. Mm -hmm. Yep. I mean, at least the Borg had cool spaceships. We'll never get there at this rate. <laughs>
Um, <laughs> so well, I, I want to go back to something that you said earlier, um, and I, I want to make sure that I'm not misrepresenting you, but you yeah. described, I think this was a, pretty much in the beginning of the conversation, you labeled or maybe called, use the term social justice left, right? Um, and what I wanted to ask you is, uh, is there a difference between the social justice left and just the left? Yes, I believe there is. Okay. Uh, you will probably find Carter and I disagreeing on this a little bit, but um, I don't write off the entirety of the left. And I understand, I think I understand why people do. I just disagree with them. There are people on the left who are true progressives, who are not in the social justice cult, who uh, do not use words as tools of manipulation, who do not use words to, uh, uh, to obfuscate truth and to lie and to, uh, to gaslight people. You know, for example, I, I listened to Jimmy Dore, who's a progressive comedian who has a podcast sure. that's very popular. Sure. I, I don't agree with Jimmy Dore on everything anymore, <laughs> but, I, but I really appreciate his perspective. And to me, he's a guy who's got his head screwed on right. He's looking for truth. And he calls out BS when he sees it. Like, uh, you know, he's not someone who fell for the Russia conspiracy, Russia collusion hoax, for example, he'll call that out. And I really think it's important if you are on the right to find those progressives like Jimmy Dore or like um, uh, Noam Chomsky. Noam Chomsky talks about how the media, the media's whole job is to manufacture consent for war. Sure. I mean, he's very, Noam Chomsky to me is someone who has, in my opinion, seems to be a truth seeker and yeah. is, is, uh, and is that not guy, in this cult. Yeah, and that guy who like, uh, I forget his name, Slavov Zizek, I think, uh, you know, he's all, he's like oh. the Russian guy that's always sniffing and, and oh, I um, don't know him, he's, but... he's a Marxist, but okay. um, I believe he is. I could be wrong about that. But Slavov Zizek, I think his name is. Well, a lot yeah. of the uh, actual, like the old school Marxist, like the classic, you know, uh, sure. so, so Marxism, the way I usually describe it is this social justice ideology is is sort of a mutated kind of Marxism. It, yeah. it changed it. That's why they Mar call it cultural Marxism. Right. Marxism of old, or the one that if you did learn about it in school, was basically said the best way to look at the world is as a competition for wealth among class groups. And that mm -hmm. uh and that we must redistribute wealth so all these class groups can become equal and we can have utopia, right? So this new kind of Marxism is about, it, it, it basically says, no, 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 the best way to look at the world is as a competition for power among identity groups. And we need to redistribute power among these identity groups and then we'll all be happy in a utopia. The actual old school Marxists, a lot of them do have a problem with these social justice Marxists. And they are the first ones to tell you in the comments, you're crazy, Carrie, this isn't Marxism. And I'm like, I know, I said it's a mutated kind. It's like, it's, it's, it's you got chocolate in my peanut butter. They got, they got identity and social yeah. justice in your Marxism and it became something else. Um, I know it's not the same, but it did arrive, it does have roots there. Mm -hmm. And um, anyway, I, I do believe there's a difference between, just to answer this, there are liberals, there are people on the left, I still consider myself a liberal, classical liberals who actually believe in uh, free speech. Imagine that liberals for free speech. Oh my gosh. Uh, individualism, you know, equal rights, but not equity, not discrimination, yeah. sure. based, you know, in order to, to make us all somehow on the same, like equal, which is ridiculous. And is, uh, there are liberals and progressives who are not on board with this. The problem is that a lot of them have been scared. They're scared of speaking up. Yeah. And over the past four years, I've maybe probably because of the nature of what we do at our podcast, I've just met, I've met more of these people. And so it seems to me that there are more people waking up every day, but maybe that's just a function of who I'm meeting. Um, but I, I do feel like in my gut that the, the tighter that they squeeze the fist and we're starting to see them squeeze it very, t there's a acceleration point happening right now, of course, on where they're mass purging people from mm -hmm. platforms. The more they and they adding into lists, fist. apparently there was yeah. a mass. Uh, a word is there was a, a a bunch of like accounts on Parler or all the accounts on Parler uh, were leaked, and uh, a bunch of leftists got their hands on it. But go on. Oh wow. Yeah, uh, but that, I don't know yeah. if it's one hundred percent confirmed, but it's something I heard about today. So. 
Well, I do think the more they do this, the more they tighten the fist, the more um galaxies slip through their fingers. Yes. <laughs> yes, okay. Uh Carter just told me this yesterday or a couple days ago. Is this a Star Wars thing? Yeah, it's a Star okay. Wars thing. Yeah. <laughs> yes. But that's true. The more they do that, mm -hmm. the more people will wake up. You know, it I didn't wake up until 2016 and and there were several things I've told this story before I don't I don't have to repeat it unless you want me to but the in a nutshell I think what happened was that everything there was an acceleration point that happened after Trump was elected there was yeah. another acceleration point that happened this past summer after George Floyd but that acceleration point in 2016 after he won um that woke me up because suddenly I saw people in my echo chamber celebrating murder like you were mm -hmm. saying celebrating the the assassination of police officers in Dallas mm -hmm. at the BLM rally I saw people talking about murdering people and I'm like what is this the thing what? is <laughs> like, uh, I want to I want to make a quick comment on Trump briefly um it was never really about him mm -hmm. uh it, it was like he's a symbolic enemy of of the left right now and the way you can confirm this is go back to when George W. Bush became president and then go back to when Ronald Reagan became president and then go back to when other people were running like uh, when Mitt Romney was running against Barack Obama look at how they treated these people back then it they they basically the rhetoric hasn't changed like they were calling Reagan a Nazi um and and uh um, if this goes, so it's not about Trump as a person. There's a pattern of this kind of rhetoric. The difference is, is that today we have social media and, and we have um, these massive like 24 hour news organizations like CNN, which we did not have in those days in the eighties, but the propaganda and the rhetoric was there uh, going all the way back. So this isn't really about Trump the person and and the funny thing is is the left still thinks it is like yeah. the people who voted for him the people who voted for him in 2016 many of those people voted for Barack Obama in 2012 and 2008 I'm one of them I voted for Obama twice okay um and I I I was one of those people that I was never in the SJW cult because I was always like critical of a lot of the identity politics stuff but I didn't really do a lot of the work understanding or trying to understand why people voted um, either under their conservative values or their right wing values, which I, I wouldn't want to get into it. But I think that those things are completely different. And um, uh, it was until I started doing the work in between because, you know, I did the Obama thing twice and everything got worse. And I'm like, well, what the hell? Right. And so um, I was like, well, I'm going to have to, like, you know, figure out what it is i don't know about the other side and, I, and I, I appreciate that you said that you that it's important that people do the work i think that to, to understand the uh principles and ideas of any um political or ideological frame like to try to understand them so like i think that as an example i think i understand feminism more than most feminists because i've looked at into it i've looked into the history i've done the show for a very long time and this is why i'm an anti-feminist because i actually know what they're about and i know what the end goal is and the same thing goes for you know um everything else that i've looked into i hold the positions i hold not because i'm just following some you know position that you're just supposed to and because somebody told me i mean they're i disagree with leftists in general on almost everything but only because i've done the work but there are plenty of conservative objectivist randian um you know minarchists anarchists conservatives right-wingers libertarians that i also disagree with on certain issues and so i've basically come to form my own set of ideas um and i guess this is why i was asking you about the difference between the sjw left and just the left and what i want and uh, what i wanted to ask you is um but i think that the social justice cult is clearly like the highest priority in terms of what we need to get rid of. And I include the Democrat Party in that, not because they are SJWs, because I honestly don't think that they legitimately believe any of that shit, and they're just doing whatever they want. They're using whoever they can to get power because basically they, they just, they, okay, you want me to say that the people who storm the Capitol are losers that need to be rounded up and, and you know, put, thrown in chains or whatever it is they, you know, Biden said. All right, yeah, I'll say that because I want your votes, right? 
So I'm not saying that these things are the same ideologically, but the, but the the sort of um, emotionally charged, uh, you know, feminine driven cult that's basically giving these people more and more power and more and more control over our lives. They are clearly the highest priority in terms of what we need to confront and deal with. Um, but and, and I, I think that we should definitely deal with that before we start working out our our own differences in terms of like what we should do after that. But the reason why I asked you about um, the left is because I want to know the, the thing I'm trying to like sort of wrestle with is this idea that um, that there is like a centrist position on, on what's happening. And I, I've been saying this for a while. Like one thing that annoys me more than anything else is a person who is always trying to find the center point on a given issue. And, and yeah, for many issues, there is a center point. But when you're talking about tyranny versus liberty, I don't see the center on that. When you see people yeah. being purged from the internet and they're they're being marginalized, and I know that, you know, m m independently owned corporations, m free market, yeah. I get that. But we're I'm not talking about using the state to stop it. I'm talking about whether or not this is morally right or morally wrong, right? And yeah. um, like, I, for example, you know, I, I think of myself as being pretty libertarian in term of, terms of my principles. And um, I'd like ideally to live in a libertarian society, but right now that's not possible. Yeah. And, and it's, it's not only not possible because of everything that's happening, it's not possible because we as a society are not in a place where we can even entertain that idea because too many people, and they don't have to be SJWs, in general, too many people are reliant on the state to solve on their the problems. State. Yes. yes. So you got to like unplug them from that and make them self-governing. And that's not going to happen. By the way, there's something that and I'm, I know I'm taking a lot of time. People are going to oh, be mad at me. Um, by the way, I meant something I meant to mention before was uh, uh, I can take it even before the stuff you were talking about regarding education. I, I Those are real issues for sure. But I think there's something that comes even before that. I think it's the destruction of the family that has contributed the most to all of this, because if someone has a father in their life and a mother and they're basically getting, you know, like an equal balance of the masculine and the feminine in their life, they won't look to the state to solve their problems. Yes. If a, if a woman is in a marriage and she's happy with her husband and they have children and their health, their relationship is healthy and not one of competition and not one of suspicion and not one of revulsion. Right they uh, that woman is not likely to be as statist because she has her husband so it's like women's interest is in security above all else right in general they they if if they're interested in having a family they want to be in a position where they can raise their children safely and a husband who is a provider and i know this is going to sound really tradcom but it's just the truth it's just the truth. A husband who is a provider will offer her the security that she feels she needs so that she won't go to the state. In fact, a woman in a stable family is more likely to vote for lower taxes and less state involvement than a woman who is single because she's going to need the state to support her and her kids. And this is by design. This is on purpose. This is why the Democrat run cities have the most single motherhood, the highest crime, the, the most, you know, absentee fathers, they have the most problems because they want those people on the state's teat. So that's the purpose of that. But anyway, yeah. so that being said, OK, um, what do you think the reasonable left wants that um, would not in itself become an issue? Oh, that's a great question. And how, and how, well, more beyond that, how is that different from what a centrist or moderate or classical okay. liberal would want? Okay, so first of all, well, the the reasonable progressives I know and the progressives I'm friends with and, and some of the ones I listen to, they're anti-war and they're anti-interventionist. And that's something that I think- I agree. People, um, that people on, you don't have to be on the left to share that position. And I think that's also why they're the ones, because if they're being honest and they've been paying attention, they know how many drones Obama was dropping. I was not one that was paying attention. I voted for him twice like you. 
uh, but probably unlike you, I quit paying attention. And I wasn't aware of that until later. I wasn't aware of how all the conflicts he got us into in, in, in Syria and in Libya and Yemen. and Because the media you know, didn't report it. Yeah. So I just had no idea. But if mm-hmm. they've been paying attention, they're honest about the fact that Trump is one of the most anti-interventionist presidents we've had in a long time. Yep. And, um, you know, they're also for prison reform. And yep. you know, what did Trump do? He did this very left thing. This very uh, left thing. Yeah, well, I think the left claims that it's their thing, but I don't think it's unique to the left. But but mm-hmm. go on, go on. I, I don't because because the left right. is isn't against war. Hillary Clinton is a war hawk. Plenty you're right. Of le- I mean, I, I, this is the thing. I, this is where well, I brought I'm it up. I'm talking about. And, but wait, I'm talking about reasonable left. The ones I yeah yeah are sure honest sure. and true. Like Clinton, Hillary Clinton. I don't. Hillary Clinton is, I guess I would call her a neoliberal. I think she's just, um, like you said, that like a Biden, she's the type who is uh, part of the system. She's going to say whatever she needs to say to to get your vote. Yes. And she's going to go along with social justice ideology and be beholden to it and then also be for war. And, you know, it, she's not a principled person. Right. And, um, but you were asking about principled leftists, like what mm-hmm. do they believe in that I think... Well, one, I think, is is the anti-war thing. The other thing I was going to say is on the issue of compromise, because, uh, and I'll get back to that question in talking about this. Sure. You were talking about how on some things there's no compromise. And uh, that's that's really interesting because Carter was just talking about this a couple of days ago, and he was saying, you know, I think you, you were talking about on the issue of tyranny, for example, there's no compromise. Well, he was giving the analogy. He's like, you know, for example, rape, is wrong there's mm-hmm. no there's no compromise right point. well how about a little bit of rape yeah no, <laughs> no. Yeah, and like theft theft right. is wrong too it's like wrong. if i was gonna mug you right and i say give me all your money and you're like how about i give you 20 bucks but not everything <laughs> right like there, that's what i'm saying yeah it's like, right so there are some things that are just uh not open for compromise and then there are other things that are and so i am in a place now my opinions are still moving on some of these things that I haven't had time in the past four years. I've decided I really need to read something thoroughly and be mm-hmm. and feel educated on all sides of it before I have an opinion. So for example, I don't have an opinion on climate change anymore. I haven't had time to read about it. My, the only opinion I have on it is that I do believe the left currently, the, the people in control on the left are using climate change in the same way they've been using COVID, for example. And racism and, and everything right, else. Yeah. To try and get more regulations and, and and to try and get more control over a populace. So I do believe that's happening. But mm-hmm. I don't have an opinion about the change of the climate itself yet. I haven't yeah. done enough reading. So uh, when it comes to something like, to go back to compromise, when it comes to something like um, uh, socialized medicine, having the government pay for health care, I don't know what I think about that anymore. I, I I don't think it's I don't think it's the thing like uh, and this is where Carter and I will disagree for sure. Mm-hmm. I don't think it's the thing like rape where I can say absolutely not. There should be no government paying for health care. I, I think that that is something where you might be able to find compromise with the left. I don't think the government should pay Maybe. for. I don't think it should be Medicare for all. Uh, but I do believe that there should be some kind of social secu- social safety net for people who can't afford it. Um, and that's even just saying that people are going to get mad at me and whatever. Just know that my my opinion on that is still open and flexible because I'm still learning about it and I'm still figuring out what I think right. about it. But I don't think it's a uncompromisable subject. Like, right. do you want rape? <laughs> you know. No, that's why I said sometimes, yeah. you know, like there there yeah. are things that you can't because there are people who fight really hard because they don't want to they're they're high in agreeableness, they don't want to upset people, so they try to figure out where the middle ground is. And that's usually based on um like who is in their circle. So if they if their circle is all people that believe as they do, then they're more likely to be less compromising. Yeah. But if their circle is a balance, then they're going to try and figure out how to either avoid the question altogether or find a middle ground between the two they, people and, will do that yeah yeah but i think it's i think the 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 thing i try to do it sounds like you try to do this i think we have a, a we probably in a similar journey in some ways is that 
once I do make up my mind, once I feel like I've done enough reading and research, and I know I, I tend to have a very strong opinion at that point, it doesn't mean I'm still, it doesn't mean I'm not open to hearing other things, but like my opinion, the way in which you said you feel very educated on feminism because you've, you've spent the time necessary to learn about it and to learn about the history and to look at the ways yeah. it manifests in culture. I feel the same way about feminism and I feel that way about social justice ideology in general. I know a lot more about it than a lot of the than most the, the people who are just now picking it up as a system of faith. And um, I, my opinion on that is, is, you know, very, I'm sure abrasive to people who are still in it yeah. um, because it's a very strong opinion, but I feel grounded. I've done the work on that issue. I know what I think about it. It is a collectivist, racist, sexist belief system. And I think it's evil. It <laughs> they is. Don't, a lot of people don't like you, when they use the word evil. No, but it's, I know, but it's true. I mean, evil. evil is a real thing. Like yeah. that's that's another centrist thing. I saw this on um, uh, Carl Benjamin, who is a friend of mine. Uh, you know Sargon of Akkad. He has this new show called the Pot, uh, Lotus Caesars Podcast. And when the um, the siege on the Capitol happened on the sixth, uh, he had on the guys from Trigonometry, which actually you've been on their show. Oh yeah, Trigonometry, right? Yeah. And they and Sargon was calling the actions of someone. I don't remember what the actions were, but they were certainly evil. And he called them evil. And one of the hosts said, I think that's a childish word. And I was like, yeah, see, you're giving the left what they want, because I'm, I'm just going to put it out there. OK, one of the you talked about manipulation of language. All right. One of the things that they have manipulated is they have erased the idea that something can be evil. That the actions, actions, not people necessarily, I'm not talking about some Disney villain like Maleficent, I'm talking about actions, can be evil. And there, and it is a real thing. If you yes. don't think that rape, murder, theft, um, those, if, if those things aren't evil, then then you don't believe in evil. I mean, that, and that's crazy. Obviously, it's, it's a real thing. I can read off this tweet that Arthur Chu made uh, where he oh, celebrated the, the, the death of that woman. Yes. Um, that's evil. Oh, and, the, and yeah, it's evil. Like, so, okay, we have to accept that evil is real and it exists and people do it. Okay. And, and that's one of the things that the, that it, it does get erased because there is an, uh, there is an attribution, I guess, or it gets attributed to religion because people think for some reason, evil is a, a, a construct from religion, but no evil is something we observed. And then some people who are religious, made it work into their religious framework it's not something that religious religion made that's that's argument from um like this idea that everything is constructed right that's that and and i i, I just wanted to stick on that point because evil is real and we we got to stop pretending like it isn't and that 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 sort of but i'm with you on that you said that there are some things that you have strong opinions are i'm 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 the same way once i've done the work and i do think doing the work is very very important regardless yeah. of where your starting point is by the way this isn't uh, you know if you were on the left you moved further right or towards the center or if you were on the right you moved further left or towards the center as long as you did the work and based on the facts you basically alter your position then i'm going to commend you for that that's yeah. something most people won't do the well the other thing about when I call it evil, the, the other reason I call it evil is that it it's not only a racist and sexist belief system like white supremacy, for example, it's racist. Yeah. But but it's also um, it it gets people to it gets people who have good intent to go out and spread the very things they think they're fighting. It turns people into foot soldiers for racism. And for sexism, and it and it does so while te while telling them they're fighting against those things. How effed up is that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that to me is like, it's not just that it pushes evil in the world. It that it's that it makes you, if you're in it, an instrument of this racism. It it turns you, it molds you into yeah. this foot soldier for something awful, while you think you're doing something good. And I think that's truly evil. Absolutely. So, Absolutely. Yeah. So, okay. So we, we've gone for over an hour. It's a great conversation, but I do want to like say a couple more things and then we'll go to the after show. It might be a little bit shorter uh, or, you know, whatever, because I have okay. gone over, but I think that the patrons will understand. So the reason why I asked you about what the left wants that makes it sort of um, better than the progressive left 
And I don't have a problem calling them progressives because they are progressing towards something. It's just not good. <laughs> but yeah. But um, uh, so I don't have a problem calling them that or what have you. Um, I think that our society, our civilization is it actually is on a slope that typically rolls down a hill towards leftism slowly. It's sort of like like we move further left the more that time moves on. If you go back to yeah. what Democrats believed 20 years ago, it's basically what Trump believes now. And, and 20 years ago, they would have been like the, the you know, the greatest people. Right. For because Trump, like he held up a, an LGBT flag like while he was running as part uh, on the campaign trail. So he's the he's the only president that's been elected who supported gay marriage when he went into office. Yes. Yes. The only one. But but the, the point is, is that as we have moved our society has moved further left and it's certainly become more liberal. And this is a distinction that I have to make because liberalism and leftism are not at all the same, even though the left has sold itself as liberalism. Um, but the the progressives has essentially or, or the SJWs, they have taken that that slope, which has basically gone at like something like this. Right. It's like a slight decline and they've dropped it straight off like they basically made it to where we're accelerating at a tremendous rate towards wherever the final outcome is going to be so um if we manage to push back against this and basically get back to a stable state again my concern is is that the normal left which is overly concerned in my mind with class um they will inevitably lead to the same outcomes like because they i i think that um i think that leftism regardless of how you frame it presumes to be in uniquely in favor of things that are not unique to itself and that whether you're talking about race gender um issues like men and women whether you're talking about sexual uh, orientation whether you're talking about being cis or trans whether you're talking about uh its relationship with religion whether you're talking about class um i think that it presents itself and this is part its biggest selling point is it is the ideology of caring about people and by making that statement it essentially positions the right as not the ideology of caring about people Mm -hmm. And I think that that is fundamentally incorrect. And um, if we don't at some point come to terms with that, come to face the idea that the left thinks that it's the only like it's sort of like how feminism claims that it's the only ideology of caring about women. Um, And if you're not a feminist, you're a bigot, which is something that they have said. I think that we are always going to have to deal with this phenomenon. It will come back around because the class warfare argument, which generally doesn't Uh, work as well in a free society will pivot to a race, gender, whatever um, conversation. Well, I think that if you could get rid of here, let me, I'm looking for this book because I want to reference this book. Uh, This is called Love Your Enemies. It's by Arthur Brooks. It's a really short read. It's a great book, but (laughs) I think uh, he didn't account for in this book, he didn't account for social justice on the left. And Mm -hmm. he's, he's writing as if we lived in a world where the left and the right just have different policy opinions and need a little help at uh, humanizing one another and understanding that you can have the same intent about wanting to help people, but have different policy positions on how to get there. This yeah. would be a great book if we had already conquered social justice ideology and now we're coming together as the right and left to understand each other better. Um, and I bring this up because I do believe that's possible. Let's say let's say that social justice died a quick death tomorrow, which it's not going to do, unfortunately, but let's say it did. And then you're left with uh, these more reasonable progressives and liberals who are concerned about or even I don't I don't think Marxists are reasonable. Let's say Marxists who believe in who, who want to talk I, I, we'll about We'll just class. say that the left is concerned with equality. I think right. that's the mo- their most they important. They are concerned. So let's yeah. see if if you took the social justice cultists out of it, sure. I actually think you could have you could get to a place where a book like this is helpful because then you could talk about how for example, um minimum wage. A lot of people on the left believe that conservatives 
they really believe this, that conservatives don't want to raise the minimum wage because they don't care about people. <laughs> right. Because, and if you, you could get to that place where you're having the conversation that's like, wait but a minute, they, for yeah. someone, but the truth I, is I they do, about, yeah, they do care they about, care about people the and that's why they oppose yes, they, minimum wage. So you exactly. have, to, so take these hypothetical pers- people on the right and left, this person, um, you know, one person opposes raising the minimum wage because they care about people. And they think if you, and, and they have a lot of evidence to show that if you raise the minimum wage, that small businesses are going to have lay people off and cut hours and mm-hmm. maybe go out of business. And then people are going to be hurt and then the by big, raising the it. big giant companies are yes. just going to automate and they're not going to hire anybody. And yes. yeah, but sure. And so even if you don't agree on the best way to help people when it comes to the minimum wage, this is the kind of book that help what I think would help the left and right, like come to, Oh, you do care. And that's why you oppose. Okay. So then we can get to the nitty gritty, yeah. which is the best policy, but now I've humanized you. And I no longer think of you as, as an evil person who opposes this policy because you don't like, because you're evil and you don't want to help people. Yes. But we can't even have that conversation right now. The left and right can't even talk to each other and, and come to those uh, points of agreement and understanding because there's this huge, uh, tyrannical authoritarian ideology that yeah, has, the, the that left has the cannibalized right. the left. Yes. And yeah, the, the left and the right <laughs> can't talk to each other because of the left. And that, I mean, that's the truth. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. I mean, I, cause I know the right wants to talk. I know that. I mean, I, I've, I've, yeah. I've had conversations with them, you know, on this very podcast, like on this series, I invite people from all over the political spectrum to come on the show and only um, people on the right or in the center or people like you are willing to do it. I mean, yeah, that, well, that, that, they're the and, only ones. And so. by virtue of being a liberal who believes in free speech and who believes in having these kind of conversations and who opposes social justice ideology, you can guess what I get called. Yeah, I get called a right Far right Nazi. Yeah, far yeah. right Nazi. <laughs> I, I don't think that I don't think there's any shame in being on the right. I, I actually have um, and I talked to Tim Moen about this and he understands me. He gets me. Um, I have a different view on the entire political spectrum conversation. I think that uh, it's also been manipulated and misrepresented. And I think the left is responsible for it. Uh, you know, the four field political compass. Yes. Um, I think that it's a lie. And I don't think that that's there's anything about that that's true, because I think there's a difference between it goes back to what you were saying about caring about people. Um, the four field political compass operates under the idea that caring about people puts you further left. So it's it's framed in that in that way. When you uh, answer questions yeah. like, oh, yeah, I believe that people should be treated this way. I believe it, that people are human beings, I believe. And, and so like the more of those questions you answer that way, the more left you go. But that's not really the important question, because if we understand that people on the left and on the right care about people, which I think they do. I don't think that there there are many people who don't. I think in general, normies believe whether they're on the left, right, or center, that that people should be cared about because they are people and they have people in their lives that they care about. Um, yeah. The only way in which the two sides differ is whether the solution needs to come from the individual or if it needs to come from the state. That's the only place where they differ, right? So like there, and, and to what degree that is. Um, what were you gonna say? Go ahead. That's one way that they also sometimes <clears throat> disagree on what is uh what's the what problem is, what is no no what is care so for oh, yeah. a, a lot of times um i think it, it tends to be that uh can, okay like if a kid is in the your kid's in the store begging for chocolate mm-hmm. and you don't give the kid chocolate because you care about your kid and you have the long-term the long-term interest of your child at heart instead of the sure. short-term and appeasing sure. them. I think the left tends to be a little bit more like the type who would care. Just give them the chocolate. Give them the chocolate. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Why don't we just teach the world not to shame him for being fat instead? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. and then they'll disagree over what's the best way to care for the child in that moment. Like, yeah. well, the best way to care is not to give the child. Oh, the best way to care is to, you know. No, I get that. But I mean, it's even then it still yeah. comes down to like, what role does the state have to play in that? I think it even yeah. in that because you're right. Um, yeah, because it, at the end of the day, uh, you know, if people are left to their own devices, 
And I think this is why people who are more conservative or even religiously conservative tend to be on the right because they tend to have the same kind of individual approach to solving problems. Like, you know, that's why they tend to give more to charity, for example, mm -hmm. um, uh, because they're like, well, I would I want to solve these problems. I care about people. I care about homelessness. I care about uh, people going hungry. But instead of saying, well, let's just raise everyone's taxes and make the government pay for it. And remember, and it's something I meant to point out before, the government doesn't actually have money. They just take our money. Yeah. And so, you know, if you but if you think that the government money is just like, you know, it's just there and and and. It's either and going to the poor or it's going to the military. Um, I think that's a bit of an oversimplification because it doesn't it just it comes from us. And so like the right would rather people on the right. And I, when I say the right, I'm talking about people who are more libertarian minded and, and on down the line. They tend to believe that if they're going to solve problems uh, that are financial in nature, that they would rather it comes out of their pocket directly as opposed to indirectly through the state. Yes. So. I agree. Well, also because, as you said, the the state doesn't actually have any money. It's taking money from people's pockets. It's also taking yeah, money it's, from our grandkids' pockets. Yep, it's taking yep. money from the pockets of people who haven't even been born yet. Yep, and it's like, printing money too, which yeah, is basically borrowing, just borrowing low, from future lower, generations. Yeah, borrowing from future generations and printing money so that you know, um, it essentially reduce. It steals money from you even if you're not paying taxes because it reduces the value of your money. Yes. So, you know, yeah. it, 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 this is stuff I never really thought about or learned until the, mm -hmm. the past few years, you know, so yeah. uh, a lot of people I know don't even and even now having conversations about economics has always been a little people in my show laugh at, because when Carter talks about it, I used to kind of glaze over and now I like really try and pay attention. So I understand because I know I need to have this information mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I know a lot of people like myself who care, especially women who are on the, who care about people more than things on average. Yeah, yeah. Uh, They're more interested in conversations about stuff like social justice and oppression. And they don't want to hear about like how the government, the, the federal reserve is yeah. stealing from you <laughs> just <Yeah>. by printing. <laughs> and, and yeah, and I think that you, when you say the, you're talking about the chocolate analogy. I think that that's also a masculine feminine thing. Like uh, a father is more likely to enforce boundaries and say, no, you can't have this. And yeah, it hurts the child in the moment, but he's thinking about his well-being and the mother is more likely to just give him what he wants um, because she doesn't want to upset her child. And 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 I think that the, what's in a, yeah, in, exactly, in a family um, setting, I will say, this is something I meant to say before, uh, you can like literally a family is a communist <laughs> setup, right? The father works and his money is redistributed to his family, his children, his wife, etc. Well, I would say it's communist, except that it's voluntary. It's, by, it's voluntary. It's by choice. Yes. So like the, the dad wants to do it, but you could, I guess, argue that a family unit is a socialist model. And I and this is goes back to something that I said before. I think that socialists and commies and Antifa and the people who want to um, essentially redistribute all wealth and they despise the rich and the people who they would consider to be hoarders and landowners and landlords and so on are people who I think most of them come from families where they didn't have that. I think that um, they there are a lot of people from broken families that pick up these ideas and they like the idea of family um, because they didn't have it. And it doesn't matter if they had both their parents and their parents were just not involved in their life, which a lot of sort of like these rich kid Antifa types, they resent uh, property because property took their parents from them because maybe they had two working parents and a lot of times they did. And so their parents were never there for them and instead they were out there pursuing money you know, chasing the big dollar, not realizing that when a father is not at home raising his kids and he's working, he's doing he's he separates himself from his kids because he loves them, because he's yeah. trying to provide for them. And it's either that or you end up with your typical Black Lives Matter protester, which is a person that in 77 percent of cases does not know their father's name. And so their mother is raising them on the state and so they basically become dependent on the state to be the provider and they don't even see 
fathers as part of that. And in fact, the SJW cult despises fathers. And it, it, so they you know, have I think, even on the, the Black Lives Matter page, which I'm sure you know, they yes. they talk about Marxism. They well, they and they talk about um, disrupting the nuclear disrupting family. The nuclear family, but mm -hmm. they they, you know, one one conversation I sometimes try to have with people who are in social justice, especially the ones who are new to it, and they think they're so righteous, especially the white women who are in it, mm -hmm. is to talk about systemic racism and, and you ask them to define it, right? Give me an example. And a lot of times they can't do it. But then if you give them an example of like, well, okay, let's talk about um, a system like welfare and whether or not it's good and well-intentioned and it has you're intending for this to help people, look at the consequences of it. And has could we have the conversation about one consequence of welfare is that you are incentivizing people not to have a father in the home because they're going to get more money if they don't have the father in the home. And over the past, you know, several decades, we've seen um, we've seen the the two parent home become less common across all races. But but it's had a disproportionate effect on the black family. It's mm -hmm. it's, it's also affected white families. You can see the rates just of, yeah, it's of going up. Yeah, but it, oh, yeah, but it but it but it but it's had a disproportionate effect. They're the ones who are always talking about you know what has a disproportionate effect on marginalized people and black people, etc. Well, mm -hmm. this has had a disproportionate effect on black families. So yeah. can we have the conversation about whether or not it's well intentioned? Is it actually? working is it if you look at the consequences is it helping is the state of the black family better today than it was in the 50s and 60s um in terms of of income and stability and you know having a father in the home which you mentioned before is is one of the uh biggest indicators of whether or not a child is going to be successful again on average it doesn't mean you mm -hmm. need a father in the home to be su successful it just means that it's a greater predictor of that than anything else oh, than yeah. class than race yep. than sex than any of that yep absolutely yeah um okay so we we, we i gotta wrap it up <laughs> okay so we're gonna go into the patron only show but let me uh read some super chats okay. and then um we'll i, I have one last thing i want to say that just to, for you guys that are watching to think about because i made this um post on my facebook page it's just a really simple little comment but rorschach's no gives us ten dollars thank you rorschach's no and he says hey brian hey carrie where's the intermittent frivolity <laughs> in this chat so that's something we have. Thank you very much for such. We have a my co my co-host Carter likes to say that he likes frivolity, but only intermittently. Oh. <laughs> so I always bring the he has to tamp down my frivolity. And uh, oh we, well, we I mean we made a, a we made we made a Star Wars reference. We Is did. that frivolity? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah, it's fine. Um, <laughs> Fillerator gives us five. Thank you, Rorschach. No, Fillerator gives us five dollars Canadian and says language control, control the vocabulary, and you control the dialogue. More than that, you control the way people think. Like if you control the language, you can control people's thoughts. Uh, you make it, you make some thoughts. Um, you separate people from some ideas so they can't articulate them, and so they can't actually talk about them. And that's by design. Yeah. This is why, like, Black Lives, going back to the nuclear family thing, Black Lives Matter doesn't talk about fatherlessness because they don't want to solve the problem. I mean, they yeah. they don't. They, yeah, they don't. They don't want to solve the problem. So, by the way, that's evil. And they Evil's make real. it they make it off limits for you to speak about that or even mm -hmm. think about it. Like you said, it's a wrong thought. It's a bad thought. Yeah. You yeah. purge it from your and mind. If you're black um, when you say it, then you're a race traitor. And if you're white when you say it, then you're just not supposed to say it. So it, it's not it's not about solving the problem. It's about controlling the narrative. They know that would fix the problem. But if it fixed the problem, then Black Lives Matter would no longer be necessary. And Black Lives Matter needs to be necessary. Otherwise, how can those women rake in tens of millions of dollars? So yeah, and have tremendous power, which they do. X-Man gives us five dollars and says the left still keeps trying to take Reagan down decades later because of his lopsided victory and his high favorability rating. Yeah, the, well, that's exactly right, because. I I have I used to be on the left, but in a, in a really uh, moderate way, I never saw all of this hatred towards rich people and all that. 
Um, but I think that at some point, even after we like resolve all this, we're gonna have to confront the issues, um, the, the the solutions and the causes that the left proposes. And the only way that's gonna happen is if we talk about it. But I think that the reason why we haven't been able to is because there is a, um, a desire to legitimize uh, hatred for the rich, because that's really what it comes from. It's not really about loving the poor. Yeah. Um, Meredith Glassberg gives us five dollars and says, "Thanks for the great conversation." Thank you, Meredith Glassberg. And then Zeranx gives us five dollars and says, "Something I've been thinking about. Most people are on the left first, and the right is an ideal. Mo most people are on the left, and the right is an ideal. Meaning, most are collectivist, and individualism is the ideal." Uh, well, collectivism is easy because it makes you feel like you're a part of something. And it, it is a way for a lot of people to avoid um, dealing with stuff in their personal life, which is why I say before that a lot of people on the left tend to be miserable and they want other people to be miserable. And part of that has to do with the fact that they're powerless. Look at how much, how hard they went after Jordan B. Peterson because he simply wrote a book that was supposed to help people strengthen their individual self 12 rules for life the only thing that you could like i've read the book okay the only thing that can come out of that is that you will find that you have more control over your life than you think you do but what would that do if people actually started down that road well they would I move away from collectivism to some degree have you guys um to, to that comment about uh how most most people are going to go along with collectivism well, they, especially if it's popular and, and currently yeah. there, there's a very, you know, white supremacy, as much as they've tried to bring out this white supremacy boogeyman the past four years, white supremacy had declined to the point where the Klan couldn't even do a parade without everyone rightly mocking them and making them yeah. feel ashamed. You know, well, like, why, it was like they, not, would get, they used to get on yes. to like Oprah and like Donahue because we wanted the circus, right? We thought yeah. it was such a joke, right? It was such a joke. And they've, and what they've done is they've actually, they've actually made white supremacy. They, they're, they're the social justice left, the social justice collective collectivists are bringing white supremacy back. Mm -hmm. They're building it. And that's what they've been doing the past four years, but it's still nowhere as as mainstream or as uh, culturally dominant as social justice collectivism is everywhere. It's in McDonald's. Mm -hmm. It's in you mm -hmm. know it's it's in all the corporations, and yep. uh, so it's widely Gillette. popular. And if you look at um, go back and look at the uh, Ash Conformity experiments. These are these experiments that were done in the I think the fifties or the sixties, and they would take they were trying to figure out they were studying the nature of social conformity. And they had these lines they would give people and they would say, tell us which line is the longest. And, and it was clearly obvious what well, this line's the longest, this line's really short, you know. And they had uh, they had people who were in on it where only one person per group wasn't in on it. And at some point, the whole group would start picking one of the shorter lines and saying, that's the longest one. Mm -hmm. and, then, and then the one person who wasn't in on it would look at what everyone else said. And, and then just they, pick it. And they, they would pick the short... They didn't want to be wrong. Yeah. They would say, and so they found, you know what they found is that over 30% of the people started picking the wrong line every time because everyone else was picking the wrong line mm -hmm. and they would 30% and uh, something like 75% of the people picked the wrong line at least once and only 25%, only one fourth of people never, never went along. Only one fourth of people did not conform at all and never picked the wrong line, no matter what everyone else said. That's really small. You yeah. Know? <laughs> like, yeah. Uh, I got a comment in the chat I want to acknowledge. Aiden Paladin, who I've had on the show, uh, she she literally <laughs> sourced what you're saying. She wrote Ash 1951. So that you know, because she's oh, cool. she, she's a research nerd. So cool. <laughs> um she she like just chimed in and she probably did did this from memory too, you weirdo. <laughs> Um, all right. Well, anyway, uh, one other thing, too, I wanted to say uh, somebody in the chat earlier asked if same sex couples are more likely to use the state than, um, you know, just like, like a pair bonded heterosexual couple with their own kids. So a same sex couple that's adopted or something or or maybe they don't have kids. I don't know. Um, actually, the interesting thing about that is that lesbian couples are far more likely to do that. But uh, homosexual men are less likely to do that. 
And in fact, homosexual men do really well financially. They make a lot of money. Um, uh, when I lived in Chicago before I had to flee because everything was on fire, um, when I lived in Chicago, I used to live near a gay neighborhood called Boys Town. And it was the most expensive neighborhood to live in in that city outside of like where the news anchors lived. And I think it's because, yeah, gay men, they do really well financially because they're both working. They don't usually have kids um, and they don't tend to have uh, problems with domestic issues like like gay men, gay male couples are actually the least likely to have domestic violence problems. And lesbian couples are the most likely the most to likely. have. Yeah, they have the highest rates. Uh, I don't know if there's a I don't want to say that there's a, co a a causative link between higher rates of domestic violence between lesbians and their um, higher dependency on uh, welfare. But they do tend to I wouldn't say it's higher than single moms. though. Single moms are the highest. But yeah, lesbian mothers, um, lesbian women that have adopted, they they'll they'll do that. Or if they have kids from like their, you know, breeder life beforehand. <laughs> so. Um, okay, so, yeah, breeder here. Uh, so, last thing I wanted to ask the chat to think about, because I think this is the what we're ultimately um, up against. If one side of the aisle believes that equality is the highest virtue, the most important thing that we are dealing with, the most, the most uh, critical issue, and another side believes that liberty is the most critical issue. How can we consolidate those two things? And um, because I think that's where the tension is at. There are people who want to be free and there are people who want everything to be fair. And our definitions of fairness um, and freedom, they're not the same for, for either side. So Do you want anyway. me to answer that? If you want gonna, to, no, um, go ahead. Oh, you know I, what? Don't answer that. Yeah, we'll we're do it in the patronly show. Okay. We're gonna move to the patronly <laughs> show, and then we can we can get into it a little bit. So, um, thanks so much for coming on, Carrie. This was a Thank great you, conversation. Brian. Thanks for having yeah. me. That was fun. Yeah, I enjoyed that. So, uh, if you guys would like to follow Carrie, I have her social media stuff. It's mostly her websites and her Twitter. Is there any any place else that you would like to send people if they're looking for you on the internet? I mean, that's it, unsafespace.com. We're in this new place, you know, where uh, we don't know how long, uh, no, none of us know how long our social medias will, uh, for us will stay up. So our yeah. hub is unsafespace.com. <laughs> yeah. yeah, go to unsafespace.com or carriesmith.net, I guess. Yep. Um, if something happens to your um, social media, you'll update us and say, well, here I am on Gab or Parler or whatever. Yeah. Um, they, you know, and we where, are in all those is, places. So. Yeah. Yeah. If you could get on Parlor, you could find us there, but you can't get on there today. I don't think. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully they'll work that out, but okay. So guys, if you like this video, please hit like subscribe. If you're not already subscribed, hit the bell for notifications, leave us a comment. And most importantly, please, please, please share this video with somebody. These conversations are more critical than ever. And I, I mean, I mean this, I'm not saying it's just because it's me. I just think that we need to start talking to each other because just like she said, the, the big tech, uh, far left platforms are tightening their grip and we could just become another system that slips through its fingers or we'll end up like Alderaan and just blown the fuck up. So um, sorry for the sorry for the language. Uh, <laughs> thanks, guys, for uh, coming on the show. We're going to head into the patron only show so you can join us there by going to feedthebadger.com and uh, setting up a monthly subscription. Thanks, guys, so much for coming on and we'll talk to you in the next video. Men's right activists are machines dude okay they are literal machines they are talking point machines they are impossible to fucking deal with especially if you have like especially if you have like a, a couple dudes who have good memory on top of that too holy shit you're fucked